um, mate. So tell me what, like, when you were full on in the medical world, what what, what type of doctor are you? Okay. I'm a cell biologist and a cell researcher. I have a PhD. I uh, ended up teaching at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine. And then later, I ended up at Stanford University School of Medicine, where my final research, I did that. And I said, I got the system. I got to get out. Okay. What was I doing? I was cloning stem cells. Mm, what are stem cells? Well, everybody, you know, these are cells in our body. I go, I'll tell you what they are. They're embryonic cells. I go, why should I have embryonic cells in me? I go, you're made out of 50 trillion cells, and every second, you lose 3 million cells. Oh, shit. Every second, we've been talking. 3 million cells dying. <laughs> yeah, Get run! Get me cells! Your life right now before they run out! <laughs> so stem cells are cells in your body that replace the ones you're losing. So that keeps us in the current state. So they're embryonic cells. I Back in 1967, before, while well, you were in nappies... Maybe or not even there I, yet. I was in. Spur I, was doing I was in my father's research. testes and my and held somewhere suspended <laughs> in the unborn. <laughs> <laughs> and well, to have later opportunity, you were already being programmed in that place before you inherited got out of it. trauma. Well, inherited that's programming. A later conversation. That's, uh, uh, programming is inherited from parent to child, okay? So so uh, I go, so what? I was cloning stem cells in 1967. There were only a handful of us in the world that even knew what the hell a stem cell was. And I was cloning them. I go, what's that? I say, I put one cell in a dish by itself, one stem cell. It divides every 10 hours about. So first there's one, then there's two, then there's four, eight, 16, 32. After a week, 30,000 cells in the Petri dish. And I go, okay. I got 30,000, what, identical cells because they came from one parent. So 30,000 genetically identical cells. I split them into three Petri dishes. And I um, grow cells in the lab in something called culture medium, a fluid, an environment. I go, what's culture medium? The laboratory version of blood. If I'm growing human cells, I look at what's human blood made out of, and then in the lab, I mix the chemicals, and I feed the cells in a culture dish so they feel at home. <laughs> and I go, so what? I said, well, in my experiment, I changed the chemistry of the culture medium slightly. So I have three different dishes, all genetically identical cells, and three different versions of culture medium. In culture medium A, environment A, the cells form muscle. In the adjacent dish with genetically identical cells, culture medium B, the cells form bone. In a third dish, genetically identical cells, culture medium C, they form fat cells. And I stopped at this experiment and go, oh my God, I'm teaching in the medical school that genes control life. And in my tissue culture is the genes didn't control any of that. Genes didn't control that. Oh, wow. It was the environment. And then I go, oh, my God, and I tell all my colleagues, and they look at me because the big gene movement was on, and they looked at me as, well, you're a weirdo, Lipton. We all know that genes control life, and that's a stupid experiment. So I repeated the experiment, repeated the experiment. It's like, hey, it's repetition. I can predict the outcome of this experiment in three days. I'll tell you what's going to happen. They ignored it because, like lemmings, they were all running to the cliff with DNA, DNA, and I'm the other way going, it's not, it's not the DNA, but nobody cared. So what? So, but the idea is, what did I learn? That they said to me, well, how does that thing work? And I said, I don't know how it works, but I can tell you the result. So for the next number of years, I started to find out how can an environmental signal adjust the genetics? And then I come to the cell membrane, the skin of the cell. It's the nervous system. Oh, no, no. In the book, it says the nucleus is the nervous system. I go, the nucleus has genes in it. What are genes? Blueprints to do what? Make the cell and its parts. And I go, I love it. You ready? The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. It's not the brain. I always joke. I say, how could a bunch of male scientists come up with the fact that the gonad's the brain? I go, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and the reality is, no, it's reproduction. That's what nucleus is. And it turns out the membrane of the cell, the skin, is the nervous system. It reads the environment and then adjusts the inside of the wow. cell. And I go, well, they were looking at the membrane as like plastic wrap to hold the cell together. I say, man, are you missing it? It's the nervous system. And if you know how it works, guess what? 
It's the foundation of the nervous system from the single cell to the human. The exact same thing. Our skin, our membrane. Hey, that's so cool. It's like a type of consciousness then. The cell is kind of conscious. The cell is aware and it's interactive. Like them octopuses, (laughs) you know, like in that octopus documentary. It's all its brain is on its outside. It's receiving information. Its consciousness is spread out. Cool. Human, Human skin. In the embryo, the back of the embryo, the back of the embryo turns in and becomes a spinal cord and a brain. It's the skin. So I go, so why is this relevant? I started to see how it worked. And it was like, oh my God, the whole damn thing is wrong. Because the cell uh, membrane, is a, it's a chip. And I'm not saying that it's like a chip. I'm telling you it's a carbon-based chip. The nucleus is a hard drive with programs in it. The information comes to the surface of the cell and there are proteins that translate the signal and turn it into behavior. And so that's the interface of life. And I go, oh my God, this thing is not controlled by genes. It's controlled by what's going on in the environment. That allows the organism to continuously adjust its biology yeah, it explains when the, evolution. the environment is changing. And mutation. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, it, it became so fundamental. Because so it's not it was random like, mutation, uh, it's conscious uh, mutation the, the, in a the, sense. That's the difference. But Darwinian biology is, oh, the first step is a random mutation. Follow what is called natural selection, meaning a mutation alters the function and nature will select it. That mutation make it better or weaker. If the mutation made it weaker, nature will select against it and eliminate. If the mutation made it better, it will proceed. And I go, so why is it relevant? So what's the first step in Darwinian theory? Accidental mutation. I go, oh, then why are we here? Accidental mutation. I say, what's our purpose? How can you have a purpose? It was an accident. I go, that theory is wrong. Darwinian theory is wrong. The more correct theory, and I'm sorry to the Brits, because they've elevated Charles Darwin to the super god of Newton. (laughs) And the reality is, the real guy who knew evolution and wrote it 50 years before Darwin, uh, on Darwin's year he was born, Lamarck wrote a th- the first scientific theory of evolution. He is the originator of the theory of evolution, Lamarck. But guess what? Well, Darwin came to the conclusion heredity genes were controlling this. Lamarck said it's the interaction of the environment and the organism that controls this. And I go, relevance and the conclusion is really critical. We didn't get here by chance. We came here as part of an evolution of a garden. The indigenous people knew this. We're in a garden. And they said, if we're in a garden, let's maintain the garden. We lost the indigenous belief. Now we come to the world of science. Francis Bacon, 1650, gives the mission statement of modern science. What is it? to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. <laughs> That's the mission statement. That's I evil. Go, you're, you're just a, a, an animal. You're, you're an animal it's like Darth in, in, in an animal mission community. Statement. So the idea is what? Lamarck is right. Environment is influences. Organisms fit the environment, not by accident, by conditioning of being an integral element, that indeed the, the indigenous people were right. We were supposed to maintain the garden, but we thought we were the boss of the garden. And how's that working out? We're facing the sixth mass extinction of life because that behavior of we're so smart Bruce, undermined the web of life. If you want to popularize these ideas, we'll all be killed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but then <laughs> they're going to take away my grant. Oh, <laughs> I don't have a grant. <laughs> well, we're going to shut you off of YouTube. And I go, ah, I don't give a damn either because... The message is getting out, and you've been giving a message of empowerment through all of your stuff, whichever way you've been talking about it, through all the other guests. It still comes down to there's an empowerment here that you haven't recognized, and when you own your empowerment, then you are in control. And until then, your program has done everything to take away your power. And it's interesting. Uh, as I said, quantum physics, the most valid science on the planet. Listen to this. An article in a more recent issue of the journal Nature, 
the British journal, the most prestigious scientific journal in the world. An article was entitled The Mental Universe by a physicist, Richard Kahn Henry. I'm not going to review the science of the article, but I will read for you now exactly the last sentence. And the last sentence in that article is, The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. Holy crap. The journal Science has an article in there that gives you the truth of quantum physics. This is an illusion, and it's Get based on that. our consciousness. <laughs> Get me that journal. Get me that journal. <laughs> I will send you that article because it's a one-page article, and it's just an essay saying they knew this what in I'm 1927. Trying to work out, Bruce Lipton, now that we've got you here, is like I'm trying to work out how to countenance our current systems of don domination with a spiritual message uh, help people that have been cynical about religion because of the sort of you know the historic sort of crimes and complications of religion to empower people individually within their own lives to transcend the limitations of their programming and to decentralize power somewhat so it's more like a membrane across the skin rather than a centralized nucleus of domination. In a sense, the sort of the metaphor systems, even at the sort of the most micro level, inform the manner of domination. And but the the challenge that we will face, Bruce, in trying to popularize these ideas is that you know that they do attack the messenger and discredit the messenger and attack the messenger because there's a, as Bill Hicks says, they've got a lot of money invested in that ride. Uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, when you're talking trillions of dollars, and then somebody comes up and says, "Hey, you don't need them." Uh, then it's easier to get rid of that one guy who says you don't need them because the rest are going to spend trillions of dollars. Uh, uh, and there is a spirituality. And this is so cool because I did not believe in spirituality. I was a scientist with genes and cells and proteins, and, and I didn't believe in it. But when I understood the nature of the cell membrane, my like, oh, my God, I'm not in here. I go, what do you mean? I, so I understand the membrane is this information processor, but there are some what are called self receptors. I go, what are they? They're on your cells. I go, what do they determine if it's muscle or liver? No, no, they're just self receptors. I go, self? What the hell is that? I say, no two people are biologically the same. Uh, if I took my cells out of my body right now and put it into you, Russell, your immune system will go, not self. And eliminate the cells. You take your cells, you put it into somebody else's body, their immune system, not self, and they eliminate the not self. I say, well, then the body knows whose cells they are. I say, how, how, where's the identity of whose cells they are? I go, each of us have a different set of these self receptors. They're not telling me muscle or bone. They're giving me self. I say, they're antennas on the surface of the cell. I go... In quantum physics, then all of a sudden you start to realize a receptor responds to a field, an energy. I go, no two people get the same reception because they have different antennas. And I go, then where's the self coming from? Conventional biology. Oh, it's the physical proteins that make you different. And I go, no, no, that's the antenna. That's a receiver. And I go, where's it receiving? Environmental information. I say, then no two people are receiving the exact same broadcast. I go, no. And I go, oh my God, this is a virtual reality suit. My identity is picked up by the receptors and I can engage the function of this suit. And I go, the receptors, and here's the first part. When I, heard, I understood it, I said, I'm not in here. It's a broadcast of Bruce coming in here. I go, well, it's like a television set. <laughs> this is the Bruce show. And I go, yeah, this is the Bruce show. And I say, what happens when your television stops working? Television dead. I go, yeah, it's dead. Did the broadcast stop? Ah, get a new TV, plug it in and tune it to the station and the show is back on again. Guess what? An embryo shows up in the future with the same set of receptors and you, your set is unique. There's no two people have the same set. An embryo shows up with the set that you have New TV, babes. You're back on a new TV. But does it make a difference to male or female? No, that's a TV set. Does it make a difference if it's white, brown, black, red, yellow? No, that's a TV set. You're not the TV. You're the broadcast. 
And if the body goes, that's cool, Bruce. Like, the, like here. almost the ultimate source yeah. is beyond space and time, beyond these limiting humanistic, animalistic, uh, imposed dimension. This this criterion that are required for our limited sensorial experience. I did a breath exercise thing yesterday with my friend Biet. And like when I do this breath exercise, it causes the sort of identity mind to shut down. And there's a brief moment before the identity mind comes back on where I feel like there is a secondary presence broadcasting through me. You can't hold it for long like a dream. You can't hold it for long like a dream. But there's a sort of like a metallic kind of extrasensory sort of static and then I come back online and I go oh, yeah I'm me and I do this stuff and this is where I live and there's the floor that I just passed out yeah. onto you know and I guess this is what like uh, you know psychedelics meditative experience asceticism can afford us to uh, tune into the yeah. uh, ultimate ulterior signal hello everyone look I'm Russell Brand I'm going to be headlining the vegan camp out next year in Nottingham on August 21st when there definitely won't be any kind of pandemic or anything like that. It'll be gone by then. That's what we're assuming by August 21st in Nottingham. Vegan camp out. You don't have to be vegan to come, but it helps. Do you remember, have you ever been to a Morrissey gig? I've seen Morrissey go, you can get rid of those fucking hot dog stands. And like, hot dog stands wheeled away. Well, the vegan camp out, there'll be no hot dog stands from the get-go, except for probably loads of really good vegan fast food. Part of my contract is I have to remain vegan in order to do it. Isn't that sort of amazing? I'm being vegan anyway, because I'm enjoying veganism, but what a lot of pressure on me. That was the kind of thing that could play on someone's mind. Listen, if you want to come to vegancampout.co.uk, come, go vegancampout.co.uk, pick up a ticket, come and see me, have a lovely vegan weekend. Find out what it's like to be a vegan. Meet other vegans. Hang with the vegans. Hear me doing... I mean, what am I going to be doing there, Jen? Do you know? <laughs> I'll be doing a talk, Being probably. vegan. I'll be being <clears throat> vegan. I'll be there being vegan. Come, go to vegancampout.co.uk for lots of vegan fun. That's right. What are you looking at? Why did you look at yourself? I just wanted to make sure I wasn't wearing any fur <laughs> coat. <laughs> I mean, just wanted to make sure I wasn't dressed like Davy Crockett or Jim Morrison. And... Even though this is the best I can do, every single bit of fabric on this little body of mine is uh, vegan. See you at the camp out.